Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to start at verse 1. And then we will read down to verse 4, and then we'll start up again in verse 11. So when you have it, just say amen tonight. Amen. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, which again is like saying, I beg you, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Verse 11, And he himself, that being Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together, by that every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself, in love. Father, I just pray tonight that you would give us the right words to speak, Lord. Give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is communicating to us, Lord. Superintend our minds that we would share exactly what the Holy Spirit would have us say. In Jesus' mighty and precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we talked this morning about God building the body and Him building the church. And that he needed to have witnesses that had a testimony in order to share so that he could send them out into all the world and preach the gospel. Jesus did that. He sent everyone into all the world. He said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He that believeth shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be destroyed. And that's what the scripture teaches us. And Jesus, of course, established the leaders that he wanted in the church at the time and he was training them up and he got them ready but they weren't really ready until they had a testimony and we talked about two different ways that a fo folks have a testimony first of all there is an eyewitness testimony this is where you've seen something and you are an eyewitness to it and we talked about many examples of where uh, the disciples were eyewitnesses to the power and the majesty of God. We talked about Paul, who was an eyewitness to the glory of Jesus when he met him on the road to Damascus. And these men all had an eyewitness account. We talked about Simon Greenleaf this morning, who was one of the founders of Harvard University and who was an expert on evidence, to which even to this day some of his principles and his ideas are still utilized, just understanding what is admissible in court in terms of evidence. We talked about how he looked at the scriptures, he looked at the gospels, and ultimately decided that what Jesus had done was truly true because of the eyewitness testimony of those who had seen it. And we talked about them having a personal testimony, and this is somewhere where I really kind of stopped this morning and parked for a while because I felt like it was so important. Up in the northeastern part of the United States, when the Mayflower came over and they were establishing a lot of the churches in the early part of America, there were, there were churches that in order to join the church, you have to be able to give what they called a conversion narrative, okay? Now, a conversion narrative was basically just your testimony. They would bring you in, you would sit before the elders or the board or whatever they would term that in those days. And to join the church, you had to be able to explain how you came to Christ. You would give them your testimony. 
and people have many different testimonies. But after hearing a person's testimony, they would decide whether or not this person has truly turned to Christ, whether they were truly saved, and then they could join the church. But this is how things were, even in the early part of America. But see, our testimony is vitally important. I talked about my personal testimony, how God brought me out of tremendous trouble and problems that I had created for myself as a teenager. And it was, it was incredible what, what God has brought me out of. And I just want to start there because that brings us sort of up to speed. And I want to continue on. And I've titled section two or part two of this message tonight, Consistently Christ-like. Okay? Consistently Christ-like. You see, if we're ever going to win the world to Jesus, if we're ever going to fulfill the Great Commission, saints, we have to live consistently Christ-like yes. in this present evil world. Amen. We have got to serve the Lord in, in the good times and the bad. We have got to stand up no matter what the pressure is. Right. And we have got to display the very image and the person mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ. Yes. That needs to be our testimony. You see, there were many men and women in, the, in ancient times that had testimonies. And as they shared them, their life match the testimony that they were preaching. How many of you know that needs to happen? Uh -huh. If I get up here and I preach Christ, I need to live Christ. Yes. If I name the name of Christ, I need to depart from iniquity. Right. I need to be loving. I need to be gentle and many other yes. things that we have talked about. Jesus told Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You say, why is that? Because he intended that his people, that his children, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith they were called. Walk worthy of the thing that he had given them to do. You see, Jesus has called me not just to be a Christian, but to be a teacher and a minister of God's word. And I have to live according to that. I have to walk worthy of that calling. You say, Brother Robert, do we have to be worthy? Well, the blood makes us worthy. This is true. That, that is absolutely true. But there is another sense in which I need to walk upright before the Lord so that I can have a good testimony before the world. Amen. And it's important that we do that. You see, Paul takes all of these thoughts, okay, that we've talked about this morning, and I want you to notice what he said once again. And I've said it numerous times already. He said, I'm begging you. He said, I am begging you. Beseech is a powerful word. It's like if I could, I, I would just get down on my knees and beg you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness. You see that? With all lowliness and gentleness. With long suffering, bearing with one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, the world's looking at the church. The world is looking at our lives as Christians. He's watching us. There's an old saying, and I believe it's true, you are the only sermon some people will ever hear. You're the only Bible that some people will ever read. So what is our life like? What kind of message is my life sending to this world? And we need to be consistent. We need it not just once in a while, not just when we're feeling good, not just when we get up on the right side of the bed. We need to get up every morning, put our feet on the ground, and walk in the very love of Jesus Christ. We need to walk before Him. Listen, if you have been born of God, if you have repented of your sins, if you have believed and if you have received the Holy Spirit, then you have the grace that you need to help build the church. You have the grace needed. God has already given it. He's already given it to us. You say, well, Brother Robert, what is grace? Well, grace, simply put, is divine enabling. That's what it is. It's when God enables us to do something that we cannot do on our own. He enables us to do it. I think about people who needed a healing. I think of the man who had a withered hand. And he was, Jesus was going to heal him on the Sabbath day. And here you had the Pharisees and you had even the Herodians were ganging up on Jesus to try to come against him. But Jesus looked around at them, the scripture said, with anger. The Greek word 
it basically is orga, orgos, which is means wrath generally. It's almost always translated as wrath in the King James. And he reached out and he told this person, stretch forth your hand. How many of you know that he couldn't do it until Jesus said that? He had a withered hand. He couldn't stretch it forth. He'd been trying to do it for years. But as soon as Jesus said it, the very word of his grace enabled him to stretch forth his hand. When Jesus spoke, he was able to do what was said. And when God called us, when he calls us to preach, when he calls us to teach, when he calls us to do whatever he wants us to do, he enables us by his grace to accomplish what he's called us to do. He doesn't send us out without equipping us. How many of you know what I'm talking about tonight? He doesn't send us out without equipping us. Where I work, I'm the director of operations. And one of the things that over the years I've been responsible for doing is making sure that the people had the tools they needed to get the job done, to make sure they had the supplies that they needed. I can't ask them to do something and then not provide what they need to do it. You see, that's part of my job. And the same thing is true in the kingdom of God. God will equip us. He will equip the saints to fulfill the calling wherewith we were called. You see, the church, saints, is a living organism. The metaphor is, once a, is of a temple. I talked about it this morning. And we are like living stones in the temple. Another metaphor is we are a body. And right here in this passage, the Bible talks about the body increasing of itself, building itself up. You see, we are the body of Christ, and we are always, as a body, growing. Every time somebody gets saved, every time they truly turn to Christ, the body grows a little bit more. It is being built up. It is growing. It is increasing over and over again. And we are part of that process. You know, we are God's husbandry. We are his fellow workers, and we are working along with the, world, with the Lord to win the world to him. But see, listen, I want you to notice something. If we want to see the body of Christ grow, if we really want to see it grow, saints, the church has to follow the pattern that Paul set forth in Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to notice again, First of all, we've already talked about, he said, walk worthy of your vocation. If you will live right, if you will serve the Lord, if you will serve him the way that you should, not just when you're at church, not just when you're around people who know you should be serving the Lord, but around everybody. How many of you know that I need to be Brother Robert no matter where I'm at? Right. If I am in Los Angeles, I need to be Brother Robert. If I show up alone in New York City, I need to be Brother Robert. I can't lay aside my Christianity right. anywhere I go. Right. I need to walk worthy of this vocation wherewith he has called me. But notice this first thing. He said, walk in lowliness. This is a word that means humility. How many of you know we need humility in this day and age? This world does not foster humility. This world is constantly trying to get people built up or building themselves up so they think more highly of themselves than they are. They want, he want, the devil wants them to walk in pride. You say, why is that? Because the devil is full of pride. If you want to be like the devil, just be proud because that's what the devil truly is. Did you know that pride is a stench in the nostrils of God? The Bible said God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you need grace, if you need God to move in your life, humble yourself before the Lord. I think of some of the wickedest, wickedest kings that ever lived in Israel. And you think, you know what? God's going to put this person in hell and turn the temperature up on them. But right about the time that judgment was going to hit, the Bible said that they would bow their knee and they would humble themselves before God and God would show them mercy. No matter how wicked they were, no matter how evil they were, some of the wickedest, if not the wickedest king in all of Israel, at one point humbled himself before God and God showed him mercy. We need to walk in humility. Yes. What does that mean? That means if somebody else gets a job that I was thinking I would like to have, I don't get upset. How many of you know I've been passed over a lot of promotions in my job? How many of you have ever been passed up for a promotion? Somebody else got it. But humility says, you know what? God doesn't have that job for me. And if, if we're proud, we will get upset. 
but we need to walk in humility. You know, no one was humble like Jesus. Did you know the Bible said that being in the form of God, he didn't think it a thing to be grasped, to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. What is the thing that we're always guarding? Our reputation. We want to have a good reputation. We want people to think good of us. We want all these things. But Jesus didn't come like that. He humbled himself as a form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And not just that, he humbled himself all the way to the cross. Think of that. He died on the cross. Think of this humiliating death that he suffered. Men were spitting upon him. They were cursing him. They were calling him every name that you could imagine. He could have called 12 legions of angels, but he never did. He humbled himself even to the death of the cross. He looked at them people. He didn't say, Lord, baptize them in fire and blood. Give them what Elijah gave the prophets of Baal. He didn't do that. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You see, he was humble. And the scripture goes on to say, wherefore, in other words, because of this, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. So saints, if we want to win the world, if we want to win St. Joe to the Lord, we're going to have to walk in humility. Secondly, we're going to have to walk in meekness. What is that? That means you have a harmless dis disposition. When you have the ability to retaliate and do damage to those who have harmed you, you say, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to retaliate. I'm not going to render evil for evil. I'm not going to, if they, if they curse me, I'm not going to curse back. I'm going to bless instead of curse. You see, it is to be harmless. It is to walk in gentleness. That's what we need to do. You know, if every time somebody were to say something evil to me, I just lash out. How many of you know that's not a good testimony? That's right. I'm not going to win anybody the Lord doing that. I need to walk before God. I need to be in meekness. You know, I don't know, when I was a young man, and I know we've got, young, we've got men here. When we were young, how many of you know, we didn't like to take stuff off people. When you started something, it was usually, you know, we're going out in the parking lot. How many of you are still with me? I mean, I don't see anybody raising their hand. That's all right. That's okay. And it's not just men. It's the ladies as well. You know what? Nobody likes to be assaulted, insulted. Nobody likes to be mocked or anything like that. But as Christians, sometimes we have to tolerate being mistreated. When we could respond, when we could act out, we just need to say, you know what? I'm going to take the high road. I'm going to keep on worshiping the Lord and I'm going to praise God. You know what? Sometimes people who are mean to you come back to you a little bit later. So you know what, Brother Robert? I just want to say, I'm so sorry for how I treated you. You know, I should have never said that to you. I didn't, I didn't mean anything. I, I didn't mean to do that. And that's what we should do. Thirdly, to be long suffering. What's that mean? It means to be patient with people. Patient with people. How many of you know the Lord was really patient with me? You know, sometimes we want to see people get saved right now. Hmm? If they don't get saved right now, we're like, you know, we're about like to be like the disciples when they went through Samaria. You know, Lord, let them have it. No, the Lord was merciful to me. You know, there was a point in my life when God got a hold of me. But he had to be merciful. He had to be long-suffering with me. He had to be patient with me. And if we're going to win people to the Lord, we have to be patient with people. We have to be patient. You know, there's been a lot of the Word of God that has been taught and preached in this church. I, I, could, I, I couldn't even imagine how much of the Word of God just right underneath of our feet has been taught to young children over the years. 10, 20, 30, 40 Plus years, the word of God has been sown in their heart. And I believe that that word is still active. That word at some point, God is going to reach down and touch that word in their life. We may not live to see it, but that God is going to touch that word and activate it in their life. And God is going to move by his spirit. So we have to be long suffering. We have to be in it for the long haul. We have to keep on praying. Don't give up. Keep on serving the Lord. And whatever you do, be consistently Christ-like in front of folks. Amen. Don't ever act out. Don't ever give the devil a reason to tell somebody not to serve God. 
Don't let it be me. Don't let it be me. Fourthly, forbearing one another in love. Listen, you have to love people. You have to love people. Notice I didn't say hate people. You have to love people. You have to have a love in your heart for people. You have to see them as a soul, first of all, for whom Christ died. Did you know Jesus died on the cross for them? Did you know that no matter what a person looks like, no matter where they're from, what part of the earth they're from, did you know that everyone is made in the very image of God? Did you know that? How many of you know we used to sing that? Jesus loves the little children, all little children of the world. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Why? Because we're all made in the image of God. I was talking to one of my sons one day. And we were talking about, because there's so much stuff, so much strife in the world, so much about racism and all that. I said, you know what, son? The thing that you need to keep in mind is that person you're looking at was made in the very image of God, just like we were. And if we hate that person, then we're hating the very image of God. But we got to love people. We got to see them, secondly, as a soul that's going to spend eternity someplace. You know, we're all going to spend eternity somewhere, saints. We all are. Our children are. Our friends are. Our family are. We're all going to be uh, spending eternity somewhere. And if the gravity of that were to hit us, I don't think we could really stand it. Because that's how serious it is. If we were somehow catapulted into eternity and we could look back and we could see all of the reality that we are about to face, I guarantee you, when we came back to the world, we would be different people. I think about how the rich young, uh, the rich, rich man, not the rich young ruler, the rich man, the Bible talked about how he had fared sumptuously and he had had a, uh, a man who had come to his house and begging all the time and he wouldn't hardly do anything for him. His name was Lazarus and that the dogs would come and lick the sores on his body. And the time came when both of them died and the rich man died. That's how the scripture put it because Jesus is telling this story. And he said, and Lazarus died and he was carried away into Abraham's bosom by the angels. And when they were both in eternity, looking across at one another, a great gulf affixed between them, one in torment and the other being comforted. It was the rich man who looked over at Lazarus and looked over at Abraham. He said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus over here and dip his finger in water and touch it to my tongue because I am tormented in this flame. And Father Abraham said, no, son. When you were on the earth, you were comforted. You had all these things. And now you're tormented and Lazarus is comforted. Beside that, there's a great gulf of fix between us so that no one can pass between me and you. And finally, the rich man just basically said, well, if that's so, then send somebody to warn my family, warn my brothers, warn them that they don't come to this terrible place where I'm at. And Father Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let him hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, he said, if you would just send someone back from the dead, then surely they would believe. And Father Abraham said, no, they have Moses and the prophets. And if they don't believe them, neither will they be changed if someone comes back from the dead. You say, well, Brother Robert, how could that be? Well, Lazarus came back from the dead, didn't change the Pharisees. Hmm? He was dead for three days. Not only did it not change them, they sought to kill Lazarus again. Here's a man who was alive, then dead three days. Now he's been resurrected and they're going to try to kill him. Now that's when you know your heart is really messed up. You are really tr not trying to hear what God is doing. But saints, listen, people are going to spend eternity someplace. There was an old story that 
I remember hearing by a gentleman by the name of Charlie Peace. Charlie Peace was a notorious criminal who lived in England. And he had done some terrible crime and they were taking him to the gallows. He was going to lose his life. And while he was going there, it was customary in those days. They had a preacher walking alongside of him, reading from the word of God. And just reading to him, probably saying things like, you need to give your life to Christ. You, you're going into a place called hell if you're not careful. If you don't repent of your sins, this is your last hope. And Charlie's peace stopped walking. And he turned around and he looked at this preacher. He said, preacher, he said, if I believed the words that you are saying right now, he said, I would crawl on my hands and knees on broken glass across England and if I could save just one person, I would say, Charlie Peace, you've done well. Think of that. He said, if I believed in this place that you're talking about, I would crawl on broken glass on my hands and knees just to save one person from that place. You see, saints, there is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. And that is the reality. I don't care if this is 2021. I don't care if it's 2050. It is still going to be true. Right. This is the message that we have. The gospel offers us a pardon. God is saying, you can be saved. I can pardon you. I can forgive all of your sins. But if not, there is a sword in the other hand that is awaiting. And we must be aware of it. If we're going to see the world changed, if we're going to see the world saved, we're going to build the body of Christ, if we're going to see this church built, we have got to get a burden for souls. We have got to get a burden for souls. We have got to allow God to change our hearts and let us see them through his eyes. If we are not humble, if we're not gentle, if we're not patient or loving, we will never fulfill the Great Commission. We will never build Hillcrest Bible Church. We'll never do it. You see, people think that if we just change the sanctuary to look a little more different. You know, when I took over as pastor of this church, there were people who came to me thinking that I was going to change a whole bunch of stuff. They wanted me to change things. And I said, well, I'm here to be the pastor of these saints who are here. And I want to do whatever I can do to help them go on serving the Lord. But you see, there's this mindset that says, if you just modernize the sanctuary, maybe if you just turn the lights off, get a disco ball up here and turn a light on and it starts flashing. Hmm? Get some colored lights up here on the platform, paint this back black wall, not brown, but black. Then maybe we'll build this church. But I'm here to tell you tonight, that is not what builds a church. What builds a church is when we are consistently Christ-like as individuals, when we so humble ourselves, when we're so gentle that we are patient with others and loving that the world cannot compete with that atmosphere. When they come in here, they experience something they can't experience in the world. Did you know that when a person runs into you, they ought to encounter the very kingdom of God? They ought to have a little taste of heaven right in your presence. You ought to be a walking, living demonstration of what heaven's going to be like so that they encounter it. And when people come into this church, saints, it doesn't make any difference. If people want to do all these different things. They want to change up the music. That's fine. But here's the thing. If you don't have what I'm talking about, you don't have the real deal. And I can tell you right now, they are manufacturing the presence of God in a lot of places because they don't have the reality I'm talking about. Right, true. We must endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. When we're in unity, saints, the spirit of God will move in this service. There's an idea that says that the Holy Spirit will come and put us in unity. Well, Jesus talked about coming together. He told them, tarry in the upper room. And when they finally got in unity, the spirit of God began to fall. You see, we have got to get into unity, not just really with one another, but we got to get in unity with the Holy Spirit. Think about that. We must get into unity with what God is wanting to do. It's not about what Brother Robert wants to do. It's not about that. 
If I were to tell you right now, saints, some of the things that the Lord has put in my spirit about this church, the possibilities that he has set before me, it would, your ears would tingle if I told you what God wants to do with this church. It would blow your mind what God wants to do. But see, he's got to get us ready. You see, we can't have our own will and expect God to bless it. Think about what I just said. We can't have our own will and then ask God to bless it. That's not how it works. You see, God blesses his own plans. He blesses his own will because he knows what he's doing and he is building his church. You see, God sets before every church. He sets before every congregation on the face of the earth, blessing and cursing. He sets before them life and death. And he says, choose life. Choose life. Turn to the Lord. Walk in your first love. Get rid of all the sin out of your church. Walk in the spirit. Hear the voice of the spirit of God and do those things that I have called you to do. We read about it over and over in the book of Revelation. The Lord has great plans for the church, but there is always the other option. And that is if there is rebellion. You see, we've been given grace, saints, to accomplish God's will. He wants to redeem people for whom Christ died. The most important issue, the most precious thing, again, is where a soul is going to spend eternity. And I said this in my notes and I highlighted it and I read over it over and over again. And I just feel this is something that I, I feel like in my own spirit that I want to say. I don't want a single soul to ever go to hell because I couldn't get my act together as a Christian. I don't want a single person to ever be discouraged, to ever miss God. I don't want to miss any opportunity. I don't want to do anything that's going to turn somebody off to Jesus Christ. I don't want a single soul to ever go to hell because I couldn't get my act together as a Christian. When Ananias and Sapphira got in the way of what God was doing, he smoked both of them dead. I don't want to be an Ananias and Sapphira. Right. You know, we can come into the church, saints, and we can get so careless. We can get to thinking, that, you know, we've been in here a thousand times. I've been to a thousand church meetings. We can get so careless that we become like Uzzah, who grew up around the Ark of the Covenant. But when God started moving that Ark and things started happening, he kept on behaving like he ordinarily would. And the ark began to ride on a cart, which it should have never been on a cart, should have been on the shoulders of the priest, but it started to wave and he reached up and he put his hand on that ark. And when he did, he was smitten dead right where he stood. You say, Brother Robert, why did that happen? I'll tell you why. Because he got careless around the things of God. And we have to be so careful. I don't want to get careless when somebody's soul is on the line. I don't want to get careless in the service when maybe somebody's going to come into a meeting and just have one opportunity to turn to Christ. I don't want to be a distraction. I don't want anything. I want that person to have an opportunity. I don't want to get in the way of anything God is doing. Amen. Amen. And then lastly, saints, if we will walk worthy of the calling that we have received from Christ, he will build his church through you and me. He'll build us. He'll build the body of Christ, but he will build this church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail, but he needs workers. He needs people who have a testimony. He needs people who are the real thing, people who will consistently live a Christ-like life no matter where they go and what they do. Father, I just thank you.